Here's to whiskey kisses, the peachy taste of sin, and my morning with the smell of brewing on the wind. Greetings, whiskey folk, or should I say, hola, tequila, amigos. I probably butchered that, um, but I'm probably going to butcher a lot of Spanish things today because we are looking not at whiskey on this edition of Drinking Out Loud, but at agave spirits and a very special Cinco de Mayo episode of Drinking Out Loud. So welcome to all Dram Association members and all uh, whiskey wanderers of the World Wide Web, or anyone happening to randomly find this whiskey lover talking about tequila uh, on video, which is, yeah, so I'm going to put it out there right at the beginning. I don't know that much about tequila um, or any agave spirits. Um, you probably, if you, if you do know a lot about tequila and uh, agave spirits, you're probably going to find mistakes in what I'm about to say. Um, I've, I've done some research and I hope my notes are relatively correct, but if you do find anything wrong with what I'm saying, drop us a comment in the comment section. If you happen to be watching on Cinco de Mayo in 2021 and it's around... 6:30 p.m. PST. Then uh, drop us a note in the uh, live uh, live chat as well. Um, yeah, I am not. I mean, I'm not even a whiskey expert. I'm so far away from being a mezcal and tequila expert. It's not even funny. But I am starting my journey. Um, this is this is something that I've discovered relatively recently. That I actually really really like the the flavors of uh, of agave spirits and i'm hoping that uh, maybe if i try more different different varieties and learn more about what makes each one unique and different and individual maybe i'll start being as passionate about uh, mexican spirits as i am about whiskies um because i mean one thing's for certain it's a damn sight cheaper to visit mexico from bc than it is to visit scotland uh, and that's actually something i'm planning to do at some point i do actually want to take a trip down to uh, down to yalisco um which i'm I might be butchering that name. Uh, it looks like Jalisco. I think it's Yalisco. Um, again, please, please let me know if I'm doing this wrong. Um, but yeah, I plan on actually taking a trip down there um, in in a year or two once things calm down, COVID-wise. Um, but yeah, it's it's really cool. So yeah, Cinco de Mayo. It's we're celebrating Mexico Mexican army's victory over the French Empire at the Battle of Puebla on May the fifth. 1862. And as an Englishman, I completely um, appreciate celebrating a victory over the French. Uh, I'm still a little sore over the Battle of 1066 and the Battle of Hastings. They got us that time, the bastards. But uh, but yeah, all jokes aside, it's it's great for Mexico to be having a huge celebration every year to celebrate them being Mexican. Uh, that's for for what I understand the 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 Cinco de Mayo uh, of the modern era. It's not so much kicking French's ass, although maybe a little bit still, but more it's just a celebration of the country of Mexico. And yeah, I'm I'm really excited to celebrate that a little bit here today at the Strath. So a little word, I know Dram Association members, you're used to getting your 5% discount on all whiskeys and anything featured you get 10% off on. These, these aren't whiskeys, but we're actually having a very special Cinco de Mayo celebration Strath-wide, actually. If you go to strathliquor.com, um, on, uh, on 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 today, the fifth of May, you can get any Mexican spirit, any tequila, any mezcal that we have in stock for ten percent off. Every single one of them, ten percent off, online only. Um, so yeah, pick yourself up a bargain. Um, if you like the idea of one of the four I'm about to try, pick one of those up. If you think you want to try something different that I'm not trying here today, pick one of those up. It's they're, they're all available for ten percent off for one day only. So. Why, why is agave spirits a thing? Why, why is that such a thing in Mexico? Well, it, it all starts actually in a pre-Columbian era. Um, they used to drink something, I think, believe it was called pulque, um, P-U-L-Q-U-E, I think it was, uh, which was a fermented agave drink. And apparently agave, I mean, it's everywhere, right, um, in, in that part of the world. Apparently it actually had a lot of religious significance in, uh, in pre-Columbian Mexico. Um, makes a lot of sense. However, when the Spanish conquistadores came over and uh, um, you know made their presence very well known, they were drinking brandy for the most part. And when that brandy ran out, they well they didn't really have much luck cultivating grapes in a short period of time. So they decided to try distilling what the locals were drinking. So they took that fermented um, agave drink and they turned it into a spirit. 
And yeah, the, the first license for making tequila, the spirit, was granted to the Cuervo family, um, a name that you might be familiar with, in 1608, which actually makes it 164 years before the first licensed Scotch distillery on record, Little Mill, in 1772. Which is weird. I never really... I, I never would have thought that these spirits actually predate Scotch whiskey in a sense. I mean, I'm sure there was illegal distillation happening for a long, long time in Scotland before then, but Scotch whiskey as we know it, and in a, in a sort of more regulated fashion, is not as old as tequila certainly is, um, which is really interesting. Yeah, so we're starting off, uh, I, I've said agave spirits and I've said tequila, they're not actually interchangeable. So. Tequila is an agave spirit, but not all agave spirits are tequilas. Uh, but we are starting off with, with a tequila today, and we're starting off with something uh, I've never tried before, but I've heard really, really good things. So there's many, many different categories of, of whiskey, um, and I, mean, I think drawing the comparison between this and scotch kind of makes an awful lot of sense in many ways. I, I've kind of got it in my head now that tequila is kind of like... The word tequila equates in Scotch to me as like single malt Speyside almost. Uh, it's region specific within the country, but it's also style, stylistically specific. It has to be a certain ingredient. It has to be blue agave, a specific subtype of agave. Um, and yeah, it has to be from the uh, Yalisco area, which apparently doesn't limit it just to Yalisco, and we'll get into that with, uh, I think, number two today. But we're starting off very much in, in the traditional Yalisco area, and we're starting off with the best-selling tequila brand in Mexico. And no, we're not having Jose Cuervo. So much like how the best-selling whiskey brands in the world aren't the same as the best, sorry, Scotch whiskey brands in the world aren't the best, same as the best-selling Scotch whiskey brands in Scotland, the same is with tequila, funnily enough. So to put that in Scotch perspective, the best-selling Scotch single malt in the world is the um, Glenfiddich 12. The best-selling Scotch single malt consistently in Scotland is Glenmore and G10. You know, both fantastic. I personally very much prefer Glenmore and G10. I think the Scots know what they're doing. And in blended Scotch, the best-selling one in the world is, of course, uh, Johnny Walker Red Label. But in Scotland, no, it's Famous Grouse. And I have to admit, I personally prefer Famous Grouse more quite a lot more than uh, than Johnny Walker Red Label. So I'm hoping that uh, this, this tequila, the hometown favorite of the Mexicans, is going to be better, in my opinion, than Jose Cuervo, because I think one of the reasons that I never really got into tequila when I was younger is that you've got very limited supply of tequila in Europe. The only tequila I ever remember having in Scotland was Jose Cuervo, and I did not like it. Maybe revisiting it now after trying several other tequilas, I might have a, a refound understanding of it, but mm, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't for me when I was 19 in Edinburgh. Um, and I never really thought about trying other ones because I was just so put off by it. I thought, well, what's the point? Um, so I'm hoping that this one is, is going to be a little different. And it's very promising. And I have to say, it's also very inexpensive. So if I do like it, it might become just something I always have. This is... Grand Centenario Plata. So, the brand Grand Centenario, um, best-selling in, in, in Mexico. It's still, to this day, a family-owned business. It was established in 1857 by a tavern owner called uh, Lazaro Gallardo uh, and was history's first tequila master distiller, apparently. I don't know how they define master distiller in tequila terms, um, but he used a blending technique that he called Selección Suave, um, which I think is awesome. Um, a, a suave selection. Um, yeah, brilliant. The style that we're starting off with here is, um, I mean, it says Tequila Blanco. It also calls itself Gran Scenario Plata. Um, so we're, we're going, Plata means silver, Blanco, you know, white. It's... Um, basically, generally means unaged. And you'll find that the vast majority of, you know, cheap, unaged Blanco tequilas are pure white. You might, hopefully the camera will pick up, this isn't pure white, this actually has a bit of colour to it. 
And that's kind of cool. Uh, and the, the reason behind that is actually this does have some age. While the majority of tequilas in this category are, of course, unaged, um, or very briefly aged, often in stainless steel, uh, sometimes in oak and then filtered for clarity. This one does have that golden hue. Um, it's made with 10-year-old agave grown in Los Altos, Jalisco, and is actually aged for 28 days in French limousine oak barrels, um, which, yeah, um, we've had some SNWS done in uh, French limousine oak. I believe it's a type of brandy cask. Um, Technically not enough time for it to be called anything else than a, a plato or a blanco. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's not, it doesn't meet the criteria for the next step up, but it does have some age on it. So it's kind of like um, how, it's kind of like how you can't call it a whiskey until it's three years old. This is technically not a reposado, but it's to going towards it, I guess, in a sense. Yeah, looking forward to this. The bottle's really cool as well. I, I remember when I first saw this bottle, I thought it looked kind of, weird and tacky and I, I actually I remember first pulling it out of a box and thinking uh, automatically starting to walk towards the um, uh, the, the sort of apatif section because it, it looks like it's going to be an apatif or a digestif to me um, but yeah I mean that actually there's a bit of a reason for that so it's very much art deco inspired um, some of the uh, some of the family decided Art Deco was the way to go and they've stuck with it for all the years. Um, and it actually features the Angel of Independence. Uh, that's the, the reason for the angel on there. It's actually on the on the cork as well. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying this one. I should probably read the bottle as well, seeing if there's any other interesting stuff on here. Grand Centenario Plata begins in the farmlands where agaves are carefully selected and then cooked in stone ovens. After two distillations, only the best tequilas are selected and blended in oak to achieve a subtle wood note and a smooth taste that distinguish our product from other silver tequilas. Cool, yeah. Um, so it's cooked in a high pressure autoclave, which apparently is the norm for uh, tequilas. It's it's kind of, to put that in a Scottish equivalent, it's kind of like, um, like steam, um, steam dried malted barley is uh, it's, it's not been peated you know it's 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 a purer way of cooking and cleaning and uh, all that um, and yeah double distilled much like the vast majority of single malt scotch let's see let's see what it's like shall we I'm I'm really excited there we go see if it's got a good cork pop. Oh! Cork pop with splash. And that was actually a very satisfying pop. C good, yeah. We're off to a good start. And actually, I can already smell it. And I actually really like the, the, the pre-nose, I guess. Fairly sure it's not the norm to uh, to have tequila in a Glencairn glass, but screw it, it's what I'm used to. If I'm gonna take a look at tequila from the eyes of a Scotch sort of perspective, then I may as well at least use the same kind of glass to give it a fair shot. Oh, that is really good. I'm getting a really strong pear juice um, with a twist of lime. Maybe that's partially because I'm used to having this kind of drink in a margarita. Um, but uh, yeah, there's definitely lime there. One of the things that I find most common in agave spirits that I don't find anywhere near as much in uh, in in whiskey is the black pepper. Really strong black pepper. Nice citrus rind, getting a little bit of licorice on the nose as well. Mmm. That is, that is delicious. It's got a nice sort of sweetened caramel note going in there as well. It's not as, it's not just straight acid abrasiveness like some uh, Blanco tequilas that I've had can be. It's got, yeah, it's like dark chocolate, caramel, black pepper, and lemon peel. And that pear kind of coming through quite nicely as well. That is very, very sippable. And yeah, I'll revisit this a little little bit later off camera and uh, try and focus my thoughts a little bit, but my first impressions are very, very good. And as I said, the price on this is fantastic. Um, 
super fantastic actually. This is regular price $40.78, which means today for our 10% uh, discount on Cinco de Mayo, you can get it for $36.70, which is frankly mad. Like, that's that's like cheap gin vodka kind of prices. Like, if it was this versus Smirnoff, it would be this absolutely every day of the week for me, right? It's that kind of price range, but just, yeah. So today I've just proven to myself that it's not that I only like expensive tequilas. Because actually that's one of the things is, since discovering I actually quite like tequilas, I've mostly stuck to the, you know, $50, $60 or more stuff. Um, and I've shied away from the, the Cuervo price range. Um, but this is solid. This is really good. Yeah, no, I'm very pleasantly surprised with this one. Hmm. It feels nice that it's got, you know, a good amount of heritage. It's still family-owned. It's it's very popular in Mexico, which is a good sign. Um, yeah. As a Scotch drinker discovering tequila, do I recommend this as a, as a blanco, as a as a silver? Absolutely, freaking lovely. Yes, I do. Um, any day of the week, I. Yeah, if you've never had this before and you want to try something that you don't mind throwing in a margarita but is also perfectly sippable on its own, highly recommend it. Actually, I'm going to give it a high recommendation. That's, yeah, that's that's very good. Alrighty, let's tuck that back away again and let's talk about what's next. So, as I mentioned... 28 days of aging for that one wasn't long enough to make it the next step up. And the next step up is Reposado. Um, so to be a Reposado, you have to be aged in white oak barrels that are at least 200 litres in size for at least two months. So this is this is a half Reposado, basically. A semi, a semi rep. Um, funnily enough, the kinds of casks that are most common, however, um, I know that that first one was using sort of brandy casks, the most common ones are ex-Jack Daniels, and ex-Canadian whiskey casks, which is kind of interesting. Um, yeah, the things you learn. So uh, we're next looking at this beautifully weird blue bottle. Um, Reposado Tequila Coralejo, I hope. Um, yeah, so it started in 1755. It was the first ever commercial distiller of tequila. Um, and honestly, very little else could be found by me when I was trying to research this. I couldn't really find much else other than it apparently has a really good restaurant on site. Um, a lot of people were saying, um, yeah, Hacienda Coralejo established 1755, product of Mexico. Yeah. Um, interesting thing, I should have mentioned the, uh, the, the Centenario, it's 40% ABV, um, as it as is kind of the norm for most um this is also 40 percent, but the same bottle in mexico is apparently only 35 uh, sorry 35 38 rather uh, only 38 percent, which is kind of interesting um for those of you that like to track exact sort of batch numbers and things it has the the lot number on the back stamped which is kind of cool so if you find a particularly good one you can hunt hunt for the unicorns hunt for the favorite ones yeah um, I tried this once before, a very, very long time ago, at what's called an IVSA, the International Vintners and Spiritus Association. It's kind of a, a trade event where um, liquor store employees and bar, um, like bar workers can, uh, can go and try new products or existing products that are being imported. Um, and I really, really liked it. And I, was, uh, I think I was one of the guys that sort of was instrumental in persuading our manager to bring this one in. Um, I haven't really tried it since, so I'm I'm looking forward to revisiting this one because this was one of the one of the tequilas that made me rethink tequila. <laughs> what is with tequila bottles and having ridiculously loud, high pitched pops? It's awesome. I love it. It's like party time pops. It's it's great. So funnily enough. Oh yeah, no, it is. It is. It is a little darker. Okay, it looks in the glass about the same color as the platter does in the bottle. Um, but of course, the volume is different to you. But if you if you actually compare glass to glass, the uh, Reposado is quite significantly darker. Ooh, orangey, orange and cinnamon on the nose. 
very nice. So this one is again double distilled. Um, one slight interesting difference in this one is that um, it's copper pot still. So whereas the first one was a column still, this one is a copper pot still and a very special type of copper pot still um, that a few small distilleries, uh, a few craft distilleries in Scotland have started to pick up now, but it's certainly not traditional in Scottish distillation, but it is very traditional in France, um, which is funny because aren't we celebrating beating the French today? Anyway, um, this is a French style still um, and it's, it's an Alembic style still. Uh, most often used in sort of cognac distillation. Again, cooked in a high pressure autoclave. Um, and this one is not actually from Ulisco. This is from uh, Guanajuato. Again, sorry if I'm buttering these names. Um, um, I, I know, I know how um, people feel when they're attempting to, uh, attempting to say like. Glenfiddich or something now and say, calling it Glenfiddich um, I'm, I'm going to try my best never to ever even snigger at someone mispronouncing a Scottish name after this experience um, but yeah I think it's Guanajuato um, which is actually sort of the highlands more mountainous region in the sort of northeastish um, um, area it's just outside of Yalisco so yeah I mean I guess you can still call it a tequila even if it's not made in Yalisco I think maybe it's using Maybe it's distilled there, but has agave that was grown in Yalisco or something. I'm not really sure. I don't really understand the details. If anyone can enlighten me, please do so. But yeah, it's certainly still using the uh, the uh, blue agave. Hmm. Not as much going on. It's much more... It's not as sweet. It's much more savory than the first one. Which is interesting because I would have thought more oak generally brings out more of those vanillins and sweetness, but yeah, definitely more toned down, a bit more savory. Even the pepper is toned down a bit. Um, gluggable. I could probably drink this by the pint. I'd be very, very unhappy the next morning, but I'd be happy for a good half hour maybe before. Um, but yeah, this um, yeah definitely toned toned down in the flavour. More delicate. Much more earthy, um, a little bit herbal. I'm getting sort of a like a rosemary esque thing going on here, rosemary and oranges. Hmm. But again, very, very drinkable. Very good. Although I have to admit. I, was, I had much, much higher hopes. Maybe it's, it's unfair because I had high hopes for this one after, you know, um, it being one of the sort of things that snapped me back into the idea of maybe discovering tequilas. Um, and this one I had absolutely no real expectation that it was going to be particularly good. This one surprised me. This one was much better than I expected. This one isn't as good as I expected potentially, but it's still very, very good. Um, I think I might have done myself no justice by hyping it up in my head a little bit. But it is, yeah, it's very, very pleasant still. Not, yeah, not not enjoying it. I'm very much still enjoying it. But I, I guess it doesn't have that sort of eye-opening, whoa, seeing all the colors in a bright thing kind of ex thing that it had the first time I tried it, right? I've, I've grown as a, as, as a tequila and mezcal drinker a little since since first trying this one. But yeah, no, it's it's still very, very nice. And if you're looking for a nice, softer um, reposado to, uh, to you know, drink on its own, um, drinking cocktails, do whatever you want with, uh, this would be a fantastic, um, a fantastic choice. I have to say, though, after trying this, I, I, I think we have a reposado from um, Centenario. So I kind of want to pick up a bottle of that, too, just to see what it's like. But yeah, this is this is very good. Uh, no complaints from me. Absolutely. Um, you can pick yourself up a bottle today. Regular price is seventy nine ninety one. Uh, right now, ten percent off, seventy one ninety two. Seventy bucks. Yeah, I mean, again, comparing to whiskey, that is a steal. Um, you can't get like high quality whiskey these days. You can get good whiskey for for eighty bucks. You can't get really really good whiskey for eighty bucks. This is still, you know. It's not the best tequila I've ever had, but it's certainly in the upper echelons. Um, 
value wise i think that is pretty pretty damn good pretty damn good indeed now there's another sort of statement age statement if you will for tequila after reposado um well there's, there's a kind of a couple of others but the next one up is añejo and that is a tequila that has been um, matured in those uh, casts, at, again, at least 200 liters for a minimum of 12 months. And then there's, there's also like extra Añejo and things after that, but we're going to stop at Añejo today. Um, and I've got a somewhat divisive one coming up. Um, yeah, I, I hope I like it because I really like the design. Um, but, you know, never judge a book by, by its cover, never... Never judge a spirit by its bottle. Um, but yeah, this is the Corzo, or Cortho, maybe. I don't know. Um, I feel Cortho is probably more accurate, so I'm going to stick with that. Sorry if I sound like an idiot. Um, it was named after the town of Chiapa de Corzo, um, and that was the location, apparently, of the last battle between the, uh, the Native Americans, the Native Mexicans, and the Spanish conquistadors. Um, the first master distiller of this brand um, named it Corzo um, to honor his indigenous ancestors, uh, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's divisive because if you look at reviews, there's a lot of people who think it's all flash, no bang. Because you're about to see the bottle and it's, it's a really distinctive design choice. Um, a lot of people think it's one of these fancy, fancy bottles with sub, like, sub quality spirit inside it sold at a premium um and it does it get it does get right through the coals in fact one of my own colleagues um in the store was like why are you picking that one i've heard it's trash I'm like okay well i i don't know i, I want to give it the benefit of the doubt and also after looking into it more it actually does really well in blind spirit competitions so i think this might be a case of people expecting a bit of a flashbang because of the design i think the design although i really personally like it is maybe not doing it very much justice because people are expecting it to kind of be a bit you know um what's what's the phrase you can't polish a turd but you can roll it in glitter i think <laughs> is, is the phrase um yeah so i don't know i'm gonna i'm gonna go in here with like like most things most things in life aren't black or white there's some more some some tone of gray in the middle um so I'm not expecting this to be the worst thing I've ever tasted, and I'm not expecting it to be the best thing I've ever tasted. But let's find out under its own merit, to the best of my, to the best of my ability, what this uh, añejo is like, and here's what it looks like. It's, I think that is cool. I don't. It might just be me. I think that's cool. It's even got like, on the neck, it's got a glass thing, so it can like sit like that, really nicely. Um, I don't know why, but yeah, I. I think it's neat. I'm going to get rid of this weird tag. Although I might read from it in a second. I'm sure it might have some information. I didn't actually look at this. But yeah, really, really cool bottle, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it is now actually owned by Bacardi. So it actually has strong links with an awful lot of Scottish distilleries that are under the same ownership. Um, again, I don't... I like it when distilleries are small family owned, they can get away with more things, be more creative and do more cool things. I don't have anything against larger companies owning distilleries because for the most part, they still give them uh, a lot of freedom. Um, and hopefully the guys at Corso are still being given a decent amount of freedom uh, after being taken, after being bought out by Bacardi. Anyway, so one of the things that might make this uh, whiskey, uh, whiskey, uh, one of the things that might make this tequila a little um, a little different flavor-wise is that the only tequila on record that uses a special technique called sparging, uh, which is where they infuse the spirit with microscopic air bubbles before they put it in the bottle, which apparently allows the tequila to breathe inside the bottle, so it'll oxidize a little bit because of that sparging process, which is kind of cool. Also, unlike the first two, this one's actually triple distilled, and the type of still it uses is, again, quite unique. Um, it seems to be made in a pot still that is made of stainless steel, um, but has a copper coil on the inside of it. So it's still getting that copper contact, uh, but the still itself is steel. Uh, yeah, um, pretty cool. Uh, we're going back to Yalisco for this one. This is in the Los Altos region of Yalisco. Um, again, this is uh, cooked with an autoclave, um, but whereas the first two tequilas were actually um, the, it was extracted by a roller mill, so that's you know when they crush the um, the actual piñas, I think they're called, the, the you know, the 
the bits of the plant that they they're processing here. Uh, this one is apparently diffused. How how that works and what that means, I'm not entirely sure, but apparently diffused. Um, it's fermented in stainless steel tanks uh, without any fiber, so it's a clear fermentation. And apparently, whilst they're fermenting it, they play classical music. Um, that's probably more for the workers than it is for the spirit, I assume. Um, and it's also triple distilled, uh, which is really cool. So these two are both double, this one's triple. Um, I can't remember if I've just mentioned that or not. I'm losing my mind. But uh, yeah, really, really cool. And this one's also aged in French oak barrels. Um, potentially the same kind of French oak barrels that the, uh, the Centenario was uh, was aged in. But yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to trying this. Let's, let's give it a try. Um, What's that little booklet I took off of it? Let's see. Using more than twice the blue agave of other super premium tequilas. Oh, so it's higher concentration of agave. Okay. Um, Corzo tequila combines art and science to create the most refined spirit possible. Unlike most tequilas, Corzo is triple distilled and includes a period of mellowing between the second and third distillation. This extra step gives Corzo extraordinary character with a full aroma and taste that captures the true flavor of the agave. It's the way tequila is supposed to taste. <laughs> That's a bold statement. To find out more about the world's finest tequila, visit Corzo.com, which I don't think works anymore. I don't think their website's up anymore. Tequila Añejo. Mellowed for more than one year in small white oak barrels for an authentic smooth flavor, Corzo Añejo is the finest super premium tequila. It's not super premium. I mean, if <laughs> I'm about to record uh, the, uh, the, the, the Dram Report news that'll actually be preceding this video so the dram report that came out a couple of weeks ago i'm about to record that next and i'm going to be talking about that uh, a fifteen thousand dollar set of whiskies so this is not super premium in a whiskey um <laughs> in a whiskey aspect but yeah, it does say it's um designed to be drunk neat well i will take that advice actually i'll tell you the price as well so <laughs> it's it's not super, super premium, but, you know, for tequilas uh, in the BC market, it's kind of on the higher side. Uh, this one's 109.48 normally, which means with 10% off, it's currently 98.53. I wish super premium whiskies were that kind of price range, because, uh, um, well, I wouldn't be as poor. <laughs> oh. It didn't have a pop, and it's actually a rubber cork, but it had a weird sort of suction sound. I don't know if the microphone picked that up. And that is a hilariously heavy sort of metal lid. Wasn't expecting that. All right, let's... Now I've got to figure out how this thing pours. I didn't, I didn't think about that either. It's like one of those weird modern faucets where it's like a waterfall. Let's see if I can aim it into the glass. Hey, success. And I don't think I lost any either. All right. Okay, Corzo, Corzo. Oh, a whole lot more flavor in that than the um, aroma in that than the Coralejo. Oh, that's neat. It's much more complex. I'm getting sort of mint aromas. I'm getting fennel. I'm getting quite a lot of much more sort of earthy, maybe coffee kind of flavors in there. Hmm. Very cool. Oh. Wow. It starts off with this slightly iodiney, like kind of like a Lefroy kind of way. It's got that sort of medicinal thing going on. It's like a, a sharp sharp entrance on the palette. Gives way to a lot of sort of grapefruit and actually tropical fruit. I want to say things like, not like the, the big strong tropical flavors, maybe something more like a dragon fruit or a star fruit maybe. Hmm. You know, I've not tried that many tequilas, and I, I'm definitely, like I said, I'm not even a whiskey expert. I'm certainly not a tequila expert. Um, but yeah, that is... Um, that, I like that. I personally quite like this. I actually like this a lot more. A lot, lot more than the Corleone. 
this this is one I could definitely see myself picking up a bottle of. I, yeah, no, I I probably will pick up a bottle of this, actually. Honestly, partially because once I've finished with it, I think this will make the most awesome um, bottle for a uh, infinity bottle for, for, for whiskey. Yeah, no, I, this, this, this... I don't, I don't get the hate. I don't think this is bland. A lot of people said this was just plain bland. I think people are, are, are mixing blandness with, like, volume of flavour. It's not loud, it's quite quiet, but it is complex, and it's kind of delicate as well. Hmm. Hmm. I do find it a little off-putting, the braggadaciousness of uh, saying in the little book there that this is how tequila's supposed to taste, but I don't know, maybe it is. I don't know, I don't know how tequila's supposed to taste. I have a feeling if it's anything like any any other, you know, spirit, it's not supposed to taste any particular way. It's a, you know... <laughs> Whiskey isn't supposed to taste like Glenfiddich 12, right? No, I, I like that. I like that. As... You know, especially on the internet, haters are gonna hate, but I, I have no hate towards this one. I, I personally really like the design of the bottle, and that is definitely influencing the fact that I'm probably going to buy one. But even even aside from that, I like I like the flavor. I think I think it's good. I think it's definitely more restrained, more toned down. I probably wouldn't drink it as often as something like this um, because this just this is just a fun tequila. Right? This is if you want to taste tequila and you want that sort of party kind of tequila <laughs> sort of uh, experience, this is it. If you want to sit there and sort of think about it a bit more and really pay attention to it and enjoy it or maybe just, you know, have a slightly more special experience, then maybe this guy, I think. And I've also realized, of course, they can't use a real cork. Uh, they've got to use a rubber one because actually I don't know if the camera can pick that up, but there's actually a slight gap because of the design of the, the funky pouring bottle. Um, the waterfall bottle, there's a bit of a, a gap where the cork would be quite exposed and you don't want it to dry out. So um, I'm not going to I'm not gonna take away points for them not using real cork because with this design, real cork simply would not work. And it's still better than a screw top. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to our final spirit today. Um, so we've talked about tequilas and the three different versions of tequilas here. And we talked about how tequila, uh, as I said early on, for me, it's it's like um, single malt space side scotch, right? It, it's it's a more restricted area and a more restricted style. So what happens if you break those restrictions? What happens if you um, if you make something in your Lisco but out of a different type of agave? Well, you get things like uh, ricea, uh, which is a, um, made with agave americana in your Lisco instead of blue agave. Um, what happens if you if you make if you make a spirit just outside, completely outside of Yalisco and, and not in, you know, the close neighboring area. Uh, well, you get something maybe like uh, Bacanora, which is made in Sonora. Uh, cool. Um, and then, of course, there is the the second most common, uh, especially in the export market, um, agave spirit after tequila. And that's what we're going to finish off on today. Um, so I'm going to quote a, a Mexican proverb I found on the Internet here, which I, I absolutely love. Tequila to wake the living, mezcal to wake the dead. I love that. So mezcal can use apparently any agave and can be made anywhere in Mexico. Uh, however, it is vastly, the vast majority of it is most commonly made in Oaxaca. Um, another difference is that unlike the tequilas here, which were, um, you know, uh, cooked with steam and pressure, this this style, the, the mezcal style, is roasted underground for several days, which is super cool. And that's a little bit like the peating process, in a sense. It's a more rustic, old-school method of, uh, in this case, cooking the piñas instead of, you know, drying the barley. But same kind of idea, I think. And that smoke, as we know with peated whiskey, sticks around. Um, so, yeah, you often you often get smoky, uh, smoky mezcals. And that doesn't necessarily mean that all mezcal is smoky. And it doesn't necessarily mean that all... all 
all smoky mezcals are very smoky. It's just not true. It's the same with peated whiskey, right? You can get peated whiskey that's 2 ppm and you can hardly even taste it's there. It just adds this interesting complexity. You can get peated whiskey that's 280 ppm and, you know, it makes your socks set on fire. Um, yeah, much the same with mezcal, apparently. And I'm going to be rediscovering a mezcal that I had at my friend Dave's house, uh, uh, previous co-worker Dave you might remember from the store he was he was big into this one and yeah I really enjoyed it too um however I was admittedly mostly paying attention to the table tennis game I was playing so I'm going to rediscover it again hopefully a little today this is the Montalobos Mezcal Artisanal uh, Espadin Joven Oaxaca Esquisito Mezcal Artisanal 100% Agave Organic Denominación de Origen Protegida uh, yeah, cool. So this is the first one today that isn't exactly 40% as well. This is 43.2, which is cool. Hello, Mexico. It's got a nice cool stamp there. Uh, yeah, so pretty cool. Uh, oh, it's got some text on the back. May as well read. Montalobos Mezcal is committed to sustainable agricultural practices, as well as maintaining local authentic methods of production. Ivan Salandania, Saldania, biologist and expert distiller, works in collaboration with mezcal producers and agave growers to bring knowledge and heritage together to create extraordinary mezcals. Cool. Made at Rancho Loma Larga in Santiago, Matalan, Oaxaca. Matat... Nope, I, I missed a syllable. It's not Matalan, it's Matatlan. Mat Matatlan. Ah. Um, yeah, organically cultivated espadin. And espadin is a, is a type of uh, agave. Uh, it translates literally to small sword, so it's kind of like more you know, narrow and less fleshy. Um, it's, its type of um, agave is uh, angustifolia. Agave angustifolia. Um, it's wild fermented in open vats as well. So, you know, much more rustic approaches. Not only is it, you know, fired underground, um, it's milled with traditional stone tahona, which I believe in uh, the Montalobos case is mule powered, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, yeah, roasted in the underground pit, fueled with pine wood and encino, uh, distilled in 300 liter copper pot stills, um, heated with direct wood fire. So this is like... If these guys are single malt space side, this is um, this is some kind of unholy malt grain Campbellton. I, I, I don't I don't really know how, where this fits in the Scotch pantheon, but it's it's cool and funky and different. Um, that's kind of kind of mezcal's calling card. It's different. Mezcal is famous because it's not tequila, <laughs> basically. And I love the, just the ginormity of this lid. Um, let's see if we get a, a nice pop. Blimey, it's stiff. Ah, and again, nice loud high-pitched pop. And yeah, you could, I don't know, you could play hockey with that. It's like a puck. So this is a uh, what they call a Joven, which is kind of the, the mezcal equivalent to a Blanco, I guess. A Blanco or a, uh, what's this one? The Plata, the Silver. Um, yeah, young or unaged. In this case, I think completely unaged, judging by the color. Maybe it's been filtered. Not, not quite sure. Oh, it's just so funky. It's so different. It's so funky. It's earthy. It feels slightly farmyardy in a, in a Loch Lomond kind of a way. Uh. Oh, I like I like this. I like the nose of this so much. It's everything I love about the weird and wonderful side of Scotch whiskey. And one of the things I love about Scotch whiskey, of course, is the huge variety that you get from it. And that's one of the things I'm learning about these uh, these agave spirits is is the variety that you get too. Oh, smoke, but not like a not like a dirty PT smoke, right? It's like it's like you're burning lemons. It's a, it's a really, although that would probably still be dirty, but it comes across as really sort of clean, like antiseptic almost. Like 
it feels like if you were to walk through a cloud of this smoke, you'd come out the other side um, cured of all your ailments. <laughs> it's kind of like a, a sharp pineapple thing on the nose, but it's also dirty. It's like a pineapple that's been rolled around in... I don't know, hay. <laughs> it's it's grassy, it's strawy, it's it's yeah. It's the other side of the coin to uh, to the tequilas in a sense. Getting a slight sort of rubberiness as well. Mmm. Yeah. And a really nice sort of um minerality. Like um like a stone like uh, flavor profile. <sighs> yeah, I feel slightly bad actually because I we had a different mezcal in the store. We were down to one bottle, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna treat myself. I'll I'll try this. I've no don't know anything about it. And I picked it up. It was 120 bucks or something, and it's good. But this this is I actually prefer this. Um, I know it's a lot more mass produced, but you know it's. It's, it's cool. It's, it's being done scientifically by a biologist. It's, you know, e eco-friendly. And they also actually support the Wolf Conservation Center. You might notice the wolf on the label. Um, they're huge supporters of the Wolf Conservation Center. So a lot of the money, well, it's not a lot of the money, but, uh, you know, a bit of the money um, goes towards uh, wolf conservation too, which is which is nice. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I like it. I, I like it a lot. And I especially like it for the fact that it's Normally sixty five dollars and thirteen cents. Um, yeah, that's yeah. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's 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 mad, mad good price. Like, there's very very little in the world of funky, interesting, smoky scotches that you can get in that price range. Sixty five thirteen. Um, right now, because of the ten percent off, you can get it for even lower than that at fifty eight sixty two. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you, if you feel like picking up one of these uh, tequilas or mezcals that I've been talking about today, head to strathlicker.com. Uh, if you're watching this on Cinco de Mayo, of course. If you're watching it later, then you're too late, sorry. Um, join us again next year, because we, we did this last year, we'll do it again next year. We will hopefully uh, make it a standing thing that every Cinco de Mayo will have 10% off of all our tequilas and mezcals. And honestly... Hopefully next year we'll have a, a bigger and better selection as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and learn more about Tequila and Mezcal and try and uh, influence the selection that we have in the store a little bit uh, as we as we go forward because I'm I'm getting to quite enjoy it. Um, don't worry though, my heart will always predominantly be well. I, I can't promise that, but I'm fairly sure my heart will predominantly always be with whiskey. Um, but it's okay to dabble. It's okay to have a sideways movement sometimes. Um, and hopefully you've enjoyed this as a alternative, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll do it again. Maybe I don't know what's what's the next what what was the next thing that makes sense? Maybe for um, uh, Bastille Day or something, we'll have a cognac tasting. I don't know. Well, <laughs> that'd be fun. Uh, maybe I don't know. I think it's too. I don't think I've got enough time now for St George's Day. That might have actually just passed. Um, we could have done a gin tasting, but at some point. At some point, we'll do some more alternative tastings, and it'll it'll be glorious. Actually, I have a Scottish whiskey taste. Uh, Scottish, Scottish. I've always got Scottish whiskey tastings planned. I have a Scottish gin tasting planned, so we'll have a Scottish gin tasting soon too. Um, but hopefully, you've enjoyed this slight diversion from our usual programming. Of course, next in only a couple of days from now, on the first Friday of the month, the next thing you'll see on this channel is going to be the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society Outturn for May. Please join us again for that. Uh, it's been wonderful having you here on Cinco de Mayo. Go order yourself a taco or from the from, from a local restaurant today. Uh, give give them your support. And, uh, yeah. Slan Chavar. I don't know what the Spanish is for cheers. Um, I, I don't know. Please tell me in the notes what the Spanish is for cheers so that next year I can say cheers in Spanish. Uh, but for now, cheers, thank you, slanchevar, and I'll see you next time. Bye.